Okay, so next up is uh, we have two speakers coming from Warwick. First one is Boris Gansicki. So Boris. Um, you'll notice I stay with a topic largely of faulty evaporation, but in a very different context. Um, so brief outline, I will go through some prelim preliminaries just to get you up to speed with some aspects that you um, need to know. I don't know to get the, well, you will see the little um, participant window, I think. Um, and then I will go into white dwarfs as being probably the best stars at photo evaporating giant planets. And then briefly talk about some exciting new stuff, which is magnetic planet star interactions in the white dwarf regime. So the preliminaries is stuff that you've probably um, heard a couple of times before. I talked about that last year at KITP. Um, basically, the very brief summary is that many white dwarfs, maybe all of them, still have remnants of planetary systems, and a lot of them show signatures of these planets because they have dusty disks, gas disks, and metals in the photospheres. And I'll photo, uh, focus on the gas disks because that is part of the topic that comes up. So we detect gas disks, and there are very, very few of them. It's just kind of a handful through double peaked emission lines, usually calcium two over here, but sometimes iron, also magnesium. Um, and that gas comes from shredded solid planetesimals and double peaked line profiles are the signature of a Keplerian rotating gas disk because you have material that is both at the same time blue shifted and red shifted on each side of the disk towards you. So if you see a double peaked line profile, you know that you're looking at a gaseous disk. Um, for the prototypical system, we were able to create a Doppler image. So this is a real image of the disk. It is in velocity coordinates, so it's a little bit confusing because the outer edge is inside and the inner edge is outside. But the main point to take away is that these disks are small, roughly one solar radius in size. And that's what we would expect because that's the tidal disruption radius for rocky bodies when they get too close to a white dwarf. And then the final thing um, is that the white dwarfs accrete the debris of planets around them, which is usually solid material ground into dust and gas. And we detect lines in the photospheres of various um, refractory and sideropheal elements. And then we do abundance comparisons to the um, objects that we know in the solar system, quite often just to bulk Earth. And I'll use that diagram later. So briefly, what do I show here? I show a ratio of each element relative to silicon, and then that ratio normalized to the same ratio in the bulk Earth. So it's a ratio of ratios, which may be confusing, but the important point to take away is that points that sit above the dotted line are enhanced in the element that is referred to. Points that sit below the line are depleted with respect to the bulk Earth. How do we know that that works? Well, we look at white dwarfs that accrete from a stellar companion, wind from a stellar companion. <coughs> and they are rich in volatile material, which uh, is by and large similar to solar compositions. And then the white dwarfs with abundant studies um, are all, again, broadly speaking, consistent with abundances of the bulk Earth. Some are a little bit enhanced in core materials, some en are enhanced in crust materials, but on average, they look like in a solar system rocky planets. Right, so this is the new stuff so that happened since last year. It all started with a spectrum um, and me looking at it and going like what's going on in there because it's a white dwarf that has emission lines of oxygen, hydrogen, and forbidden sulfur. And so I hadn't seen anything like that before. Um, the observer approach is we need more data, which we got last January. And shown here in black are the emission lines from this new system and for comparison is the prototypical gaseous debris disk around the white dwarf, which has the strong calcium lines. Iron lines, we detect neither calcium nor iron in this new star, but we see oxygen, hydrogen, and several lines of sulfur, so just volatiles. And we go on and we measure the abundances of the material in two different ways. So that's also the new, uh, first, uh, kind of the first time that we could do that both in the disk using a photoionization model, um, modeling the strength and shape of the emission lines. So we get abundances for hydrogen, oxygen, and sulfur. 
and in the atmosphere of the white dwarf where the material is then kind of coming down into and there we get abundances of oxygen and sulfur. We can't measure hydrogen because the atmosphere itself is composed of hydrogen. And um, it took me quite a while to figure out how this may fit into the context of planets. And I was just looking at a textbook at the composition of giant planets. And I looked at that diagram over here and thought that's pretty good. H2O and H2S, that's what we see, hydrogen, um, sulfur, and oxygen. We are not terribly sensitive to carbon or nitrogen. They don't have strong lines in the optical, but we do see the other three elements. Um, and that's actually an interesting story because it's only since two years that we have a detection of hydrogen sulfide in the atmospheres of Uranus and Neptune in 2019, even though that composition had been around um, as a model for the best of almost 30 years. So this is now confirmed that the atmospheres of the ice giants have large amounts of hydrogen sulfide in it. Right, so same diagram as before. Um, what do we learn? We see that we have volatiles. So this time I normalize to oxygen because we don't detect silicon. So we have hydrogen, sulfur, and oxygen, which is broadly speaking compatible with something between solar and chondrite abundances, but all the heavy elements that you would find in rocks, so calcium, magnesium, iron, silicon, they are not detected with fairly good upper limits. And this is a log scale, so calcium is 10 to the five is a factor 100,000 less abundant than in the bulk Earth. So it's basically just gaseous material. And we concluded that that's a giant planet um, that is losing mass that then eventually uh, forms a disk around the white dwarf and ends up on the white dwarf. But why is it losing mass? And there we go to, again, to uh, main sequence planets and get some inspiration. So if you have sufficient UV or better saying extreme ultraviolet flux, you will photo evaporate the atmospheres of giant planets. That's shown here in this diagram where you have the emission of the star. And then the left hand side, the emission is eaten away by neutral hydrogen that is evaporating off the uh, giant planet GJ436b. So the same thing is happening in this white dwarf system. And the one critical parameter that drives the mass loss rate from the planet is the extreme ultraviolet flux um, that is incident, incident upon the planet. And thinking about it, we figured out that white dwarfs are actually the most extreme ultraluminous rich sources of photons of all stars, at least when they're young. This HR diagram shows the extreme uh, ultraviolet luminosity color coded on a log scale. So this is the sun when it goes down on the main sequence, it sits on the main sequence, becomes a red giant planetary nebula. And when it's over here, a hot young white dwarf, it emits 10 solar luminosities as pure EUV flux. So that is an enormous amount of photons that can drive photo evaporation. The star that we are looking at here is at 27,000 degrees, so still has a sufficient amount of EUV flux to photo evaporate a nearby planet. The last puzzle that we had was that we see an uh, underabundance of hydrogen with respect to what we would expect. And the solution comes from the solar system, looking at the solar system, the uh, Lyman alpha flux of the sun, which is shown here in yellow, is strong enough to stop the infall of neutral hydrogen onto the sun. And uh, the Lyman alpha flux of the white dwarf is kind of drawn here on exactly kind of same absolute scale and so that white dwarf has the same flux in the core of Lyman alpha, and then it actually has more flux on each of the blue and red side of Lyman alpha and prevents the infall of hydrogen and just kind of blows it out. And that's, that's how we imagine the system looks like. We have a large disk, about 10 solar radio, radii to an evaporating planet. And the exciting part is that we can measure the abundances of exoplanet giants by looking both at the disk and the white dwarf photosphere. Very quickly, what does that mean? So in the solar system, the sun will become a white dwarf. It will sit over here, have a luminosity of a few solar luminosities of extreme ultraviolet flux. The giant planets will migrate out by about a factor two. So Jupiter will sit at 10 AU at that point. And here in the top diagram is shown the extreme ultraviolet flux that um, the planets receive at that orbital separation. And you can see, again, that's a log scale, that a hot white dwarf has many, many orders of magnitude more 
UV flux than even the young sun, ha sun hat. And so the white dwarf left behind by the sun will photo evaporate the, all four giant planets at the large separations where they are. Some of that material will be captured by the white dwarf and make it back onto the white dwarf. This is now shown here in the bottom panel as a function of the effective temperature or cooling age and mega years up here. And that red box up here represents the amount of material ending up on the white dwarf that is spectroscopically detectable. So if some alien astronomer looks at the solar white dwarf within the first, say, 10 million years after um, the sun becomes a white dwarf, that astronomer would be able to detect the atmospheres of the outer four gas giants in the spectrum of the solar white dwarf which is kind of pretty amazing. Now, if this will happen to the, white, uh, to the sun, what about other hot white dwarfs? Well, we know that 50% of hot white dwarfs have volatile contaminated atmospheres. We see carbon, sulfur, phosphorus. And we did a quick planet population model and showed that the number and the evolution of those elements with cooling age is compatible with about half of those having um, giant planets. Okay, so quickly into the um, third part of the talk, uh, which is kind of brand new. Well, not really, it's kind of it's based on old stuff, but brand new additions. So this goes back 35 years to a discovery by Greenstein and McCarthy, who found a single white dwarf that exhibits Zeeman split Balmer emission lines. So you have here the three components of H-alpha split in a field of 11 mega gauss. It's a single star, it doesn't show radio velocities, it doesn't have an infrared excess, and these lines didn't vary by much. It was later found that um, the star is photometrically variable with a period of around two hours, which is interpreted as the uh, rotation period. And um, there was no model that can explain these emission lines for quite a while until Lee et al. came up with the idea that you have a inductor so in very simple terms, it's just like a giant dynamo. You have a conducting planet core, and um, Dimitri will probably talk about that a bit more, that orbits close enough that it is within the magnetic field of the white dwarf and generates a current that heats the white dwarf near the um, magnetic poles, which leads to the emission lines. Okay, so it was one star, one model for a very long time until earlier this year when Josh Redding found a second star, which has uh, H beta, Zeeman split emission lines. It is photometrically variable with a period of just five minutes. So that's extremely short. And in all other respects, it looked very similar to GD356. And then just a few weeks later, um, we followed up a star which we thought might be an interacting binary because it has some H alpha emission. The Sloan spectrum is pretty poor. We got some even poorer data, but it confirmed the H alpha emission. We uh, got a spectrum on the GTC and we detect Zeeman split H alpha and H beta emission very, very nicely. And so now we have three stars of this kind. And if we look at their properties, they're almost identical. So they have almost identical temperatures close to 8,000 degrees, masses around 0.6 plus minus a bit, cooling ages of one and a half giga years plus minus half a giga year, and similar field strength. The only thing that differs is their rotation periods. And that is surprising because white dwarfs can span a huge uh, space and parameters. And these three stars, if you look at them where they sit on the HR diagram, they sit in the middle here. And if we zoom in, they're clustered as extremely tightly. And there's a lot of other magnetic white dwarfs, normal white dwarfs, both hotter and cooler. None of them shows these um, emission lines. And so that calls for some mechanism, which is kind of summarized here. It must be a mechanism that turns on only when the uh, star reaches rough about one and a half giga years of cooling age, and we have a toy model in the works for that. And it has also to quickly switch off again because we don't see emission lines in colder white dwarfs, and uh, Dimitri will probably talk about that a bit more. And it requires a close-in conductive planet or planet core. And so all three stars um, are within 100 parsec, and so that means if we find three stars fairly serendipitously that have conductive planet cores on over the period of a few days. They are very rare and it's kind of quite exciting. It's yet another link to planets around white dwarf. Um, and I stop here. Okay, thank you, Boris. Uh, 
lots of fun topics in, in that talk. Any questions? So I have a first question. Um, well, first of all, what is this toy model that you mentioned right here at the end? Um, so we think it may have to do with crystallization of the white dwarf core that turns on the magnetic field when they reach that age. That, that has been discussed in literature and it's kind of very hand wavy everything. But you need the magnetic field in the first case to start the inductor model. And if there's an age dependent um, effect on the magnetic field strength, that could do the trick. Okay. All right, we also have a question from Lynn about the origin of the O1 and I just moved O1 and S1 emission. Okay, so the emission comes that that is atmospheric material that is evaporated off the giant planet. It forms a disk of gas around the white dwarf and then that gas is photoionized by the ultraviolet photons of the white dwarf. Um, it's mainly absorbing ultraviolet photons and then cools by emission of the optical lines that we detect. So it's basically, it's the gas in a disk around the white dwarf. Uh, Lynn also specifies it's the forbidden lines that are collisional. Uh, that explanation still applies to those forbidden lines? Yeah, so we, we the, the model that we do actually, well, I, if I can go back, you can see that the forbidden lines are narrower than the other lines, and that immediately means that they come from further out. So this is drawn in velocity space, and if you compare H alpha to the forbidden sulfur two lines, they um, come from regions that are further away from the white dwarf and so uh, may have lower densities and, and less incident UV flux. Okay, thanks. Um, maybe we have time for one more. Let's try Jack again. Jack says he does not think, oh wait, I'm not sure if this applies. I think that applies to an older thread. Um, Okay, let's move to Carrie, who asks, um, for, says, for what is worth, there's a solar system structure that is dominated by sulfur and oxygen atoms, the Jovian Ioflux torus. The XUV emission from the torus can be explained by excited sulfur and oxygen. Should an Io like highly volcanic source space model explain your observations rather than an evaporating giant planet? Um, I'm not quite sure because in, in, if it's related to a, to a moon um, losing material, I would expect some refractories as well, not only, not only volatiles, but maybe we can pick that up offline later. Yeah, yeah, that's a good question. Okay, thank you, Boris.